But our next three speakers are a remarkable trio. And the things that they're going to talk to us about are profoundly foundational to what it means to be an engaged and active citizen in this country. We're going to talk about how it is that we work and organize work. We're going to talk about how we care for one another. And then we're going to talk about how we claim this country. And the three people who are going to present each of these ideas in succession, I'm going to introduce them as a block and then, um, and then turn over the stage. Uh, our first one will be David Rolf. Uh, many of you know. Yeah. Is that an SEIU shout out there? David Rolf uh, is both a uh, regional leader here in the labor movement running SEIU 775 Northwest. Uh, uh, the Home Care Workers Union, one of the fastest growing unions in the country, uh, but he's also an executive vice president of SEIU International. And I, I, you know, I am somewhat prone to hyperbole, but this is not hyperbole. David Rolf is one of the most vital, cutting edge thinkers and practitioners on the future of labor in the United States. And uh, he's going to speak on that topic. He's going to be followed uh, by a, a friend and a, a, and a bit of a hero of mine, uh, Ai Jen Poo. Some of you got to hear from her last year at our conference. Ai Jen Poo is the founder and director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, but also of an initiative called Caring Across Generations, which she will talk a bit about. Uh, and then uh, finally in this trio, we will hear from Jose Antonio Vargas, the, yeah, all right, Jose Antonio Vargas, the uh, co-founder of Define American. Uh, and so we're going to have a wonderful conversation here. And let me now turn over the stage uh, bef uh, to David Rolf. And by the way, uh, uh, those of you who are Seattle residents or Seattle area residents, uh, the Pacific Northwest Magazine and the Seattle Times just has a giant uh, uh, profile of David and the work he's doing to revitalize and reimagine labor and citizenship in our region and our country. And I think that's been uh, set out at the resource table. So make sure uh, when you leave at the end of the day that you grab a copy of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, David Rolf. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, when I address union meetings, I start, good afternoon, sisters and brothers. So good afternoon, sisters and brothers. I'm here today because really I need your help and I need your thoughts and I need your action. The conference that we're here today uh, attending is about citizenship and about patriotism. And when I think about my love of my country, I think about not some mythology about being a part of a nation that was born in perfection. Our nation was hardly born in perfection. What we did have is part of our foundational documents was a dream of liberty and justice for all, written into our national character as our national assignment. And that dream of liberty and justice for all, the American dream, was passed along through great struggle more robustly to each passing generation for the first 200 years of our republic. In put in normal day-to-day -day terms, it means that most parents, most of the time, for most of American history, could look their kids in the eye and honestly say that if you try, if you work hard, it's likely, it's not certain, but it's likely that your life will be better than mine and that you will have a greater share of our na nation's liberty and its prosperity than I did. For the first time, though, sisters and brothers, that American dream is at an incredible risk. And if there's one thing uh, that I have to say or that I want people to remember from this discussion today, it's that the biggest lie of our times is that there's nothing we can do about that. Now, I'd like people to imagine, I see people of all different age groups in the room today, so some of you will have to go back a little earlier than your own life to imagine this, but I can me remember it from my childhood. Imagine it was 40 years ago, and instead of attending a citizenship conference, we were attending a political convention, and instead of listening to us, we were listening to a politician, and imagine that that politician got up here on stage and said, I promise, it's the, even though the 1970s are a difficult decade, we're going to get through them all right. There's not going to be any more gasoline lines, no more double-digit inflation and unemployment. 
we are actually going to see in just a few years the fall of global communism. We're going to see no more foreign military threats to the United States. We are going to continue to be the richest country on earth. Our workers will continue to be the most productive. And in fact, we are going to give birth to new industries right here that will change the life of nearly every person on the planet and create more wealth in the next 30 years than has been created in all of human history up to now. It would have been a pretty incredible speech. Hard to believe, in fact. But then imagine that, you know, Jerry Ford or Jimmy Carter went on to say, and all that wealth, well, 93% of it's going to go to the top 1% of income earners. The rest to the top 10%. None to the bottom 90%. The bottom 50% are going to have to take a pay cut. We're going to eliminate private sector retirement pensions. We're going to shift health care costs onto consumers. We're going to shred public education funding, make college unaffordable for working class kids, export manufacturing, import third world wages, bust the unions, detax, deregulate, globalize, privatize, the net economic impact of women doubling their workforce participation from 1977 to 2012 will be zero dollars in take-home pay for the bottom 90 percent of income earning households. And the same family that today can afford a little red brick ranch house and a station wagon to pile the kids in and drive to Yellowstone for a week once a year on one person's income will need at least three incomes to afford the same lifestyle. If someone, if someone had said that, they would have been booed off of this stage. They would have lost their election and their political power party would have been out of power for a generation. But instead, through acts of malice and negligence, those are the actual deliverables given to us today by members of both political parties. No one would have voted for that. We are the richest country with the most productive citizens. Yet we have the highest levels of inequality since before the Great Depression. Wages haven't kept up with productivity since the early 1970s. The vast majority of gains both before and after the 2008 financial collapse have gone to the wealthiest. By the way, the top 1% never saw their wealth decrease during that financial crash, even though our future demographic majority, black and Latino households, now have well under $10,000 in median net worth, including home equity. But even men, hardly historically an oppressed group, have seen their, or even college-educated men, have seen their lifetime earning power decline since the late 1960s. Only a handful of private sector workers have pensions anymore. 49% of Americans have no retirement savings whatsoever. Corporations pay an all-time low in their federal tax rate. There's been a 172% increase in people working past the age of 75. And between 20, 2009 and 2020, uh, the percentage of Americans in low-wage jobs will increase from 24 to 48.2%, according to BLS statistics. By the end of the decade, half or more of all workers will be temps, on-call workers, freelancers, part-timers, independent contractors, or migrant workers. And 17 of the 20 fastest growing job categories in the U.S. don't require any college. 15 of those 20 pay less than $30,000 a year. Only two pay more than $60,000 a year. We are becoming a low-wage nation. So if there was ever a moment when we needed a strong workers movement and a strong labor movement in this country, it's now. But American unions are at our weakest point since the 19th century. We are getting smaller and weaker every year. Our models are old. They are optimized for the industrial economy of 1935. So the truth is, no matter how much we may wish it, that old labor movement is not coming back. Any more than the Free Soil Party, the Temperance Movement, the Grange, or Abraham Lincoln himself. Which leaves us with two choices. Patriotic American citizens can spend their time worrying about something else. We can accept that innate immutable and permanent uh, characteristics and laws of late capitalism are growing inequality, high relative levels of poverty, low levels of intergenerational social mobility, and that the number of available good jobs will always be less than half of the number of job seekers. Now that would be treating the economy sort of like it's the weather. It may suck, but there's nothing you can do about it. Or we can make another choice. 
Instead of thinking about the economy like the weather, we can think about it a little more like the environment. Now, with the environment, we know there are some things, like the laws of physics and chemistry, that are unlikely to change. They're just going to be true and outside of our control no matter what. But with the environment, I also think it's fair to say that the global consensus is that what we do matters, that what people do matters. What lawmakers do, what regulators do, what shareholders do, what boards of directors do, what companies do, what non-governmental organizations do, what consumers do, and even what citizens do. I suspect that everyone during their life has made choices as consumers, as citizens, as voters, and perhaps as the leaders of organizations or institutions about how to do something differently because you wished to see a different environmental outcome than the one you were seeing. I was born in Ohio. The year I was born, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire, and not actually for the first time. Today, there are bald eagles making their habitat in the Cuyahoga River Valley. There are 40 species of fish that swim down the Cuyahoga River, including steelhead trout and northern pike, fish that need clean water. And things, people did, made a difference. And, and the thing about that movement is that no one said there's only one right form of environmentalism. No one said that the lawyers shouldn't litigate against polluters because the only right thing to do is buy up land for conservation. No one said that uh, we shouldn't change agricultural practices because instead what we need to change is consumer behavior. Or that we shouldn't lobby government, we should just try to elect better politicians. We shouldn't try to change corporate behavior if we haven't yet started a recycling program in our township. No one said any of those things. People did all of them. And, and the result of them doing all of them is real change. Not change that's easy, not change that's cheap. Change that requires generations to truly accomplish and change that requires cultural and economic shifts in order to make real. The same was true in the history of the labor movement. The same was true of the history of the civil rights movement. We never said there was only one right form, only one right way, whether it was sitting in or filing lawsuits or whatever it may have been, in order to achieve those goals. But somehow, workers' movements in this country have been tracked into a, if it's not collective bargaining and if it's not a union, there's just nothing we can do. And of course, it's just about as easy to get collective bargaining or to get a union. It's actually much harder to do that than it is to say, you know, refinancing your house in your pajamas on the internet late at night. Uh, a transaction worth hundreds of thousands of dollars is easier to undertake than organizing a union. So why are we so stuck with an industrial relations model that was the, the country's very best idea in 1935? Why can't, instead of uh, waiting for that movement to come back or for someone else to solve the problem of the future economy, why can't all of us as innovators and citizens begin to do it together? And, and not because there's and not to say, oh, well, your way is the wrong way, but let's try a thousand things and see what works. Can we imagine, just like the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, or so many movements before us, having people experimenting with cooperative forms of ownership while others experiment with uh, trying to change the direction of Washington, D.C. and state capitals using politics? Can we imagine some people forming new forms of worker organizations while others formed companies that add as part of their mission statement building a middle-class prosperous workforce? Can we imagine how to enlist, just as the other movements have, both the shareholders and the citizens, the consumers, and the educators, the artists, and the thinkers in one collaborative effort to change the direction of our country and restore the American dream. I think that our generation is the one that must do it. I say to friends who are, find themselves elected to be governors or senators or congressmen, you know, it may not be your fault you were born when you were born, at a moment when the American dream is at risk of dying forever. It may not be your fault that you were called into leadership, but it will be your fault if you don't do anything about it. And so I want to suggest to all of us today is it is time for risk. It is time for courage, for experimentation, for letting a thousand flowers bloom, not for waiting for experts or politicians or labor leaders or anyone else to figure it out for you. If I could tell you what the answer was, I would. I can't. 
because I don't know. But what I hope people will leave here today and do and figure out, as thousands and tens of thousands and millions eventually did around the challenges of civil rights and the challenges of saving the planet's environment, how every, that every day you can do something to help align our future for a more robust and prosperous economy. Not just for those at the top of the income scale, but for everybody. To think about how you can invent a new organization, how you can change the things that you can change in your household or in your daily behavior. What can you do online? What can you do in your job? What can you do with your friends and your family? How do we create a new ethic about a robust and prosperous country where the citizens and the consumers actually take charge cooperatively and collectively with plotting a new economic future and not believing the economy is like the weather and not believing that it is inevitable that America's prosperity will decline and that the only true statement we could say to a room full of 30 kids is that 27 of you will live less prosperous lives than your parents. Like I said, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how to do it. I know it will take rooms 10 times the size over a, the course of a generation to come up with these answers. But we need a new labor movement and a new workers movement and a new consensus about the value of work and shared prosperity now more than ever in the history of our nation. If it, had been, if it were easy, it would have been done already. But if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Thank you very much.